Hey, sustainability champions, Daniel Hartz here. Did you know when the electricity grid has higher demand than forecasted, the grid turns on a peaking power plant to quickly produce enough, enough energy to meet the demand? These peaker plants, as they're called, are expensive to run, and they typically burn coal or other fossil fuels and produce two to three times more emissions than a standard power plant. So today I'm speaking with sustainability champion Cisco DeVries, the CEO of Ohm Connect, who saw this challenge and decided to do something about it. Ohm Connect reduces the amount of energy you use when the grid has higher than predicted demand. And by reducing your energy consumption, you protect the environment by preventing the grid from turning on those peaker plants. And in the process, you get paid for the energy you save. Before Ohm Connect, Cisco co-founded Renew Financial, which became one of the largest dedicated clean energy finance companies in the US. Plus, he was the chief of staff to the Berkeley mayor, Tom Bates, and he was appointed by President Bill Clinton to serve as an aide to the US Secretary of Energy in 1996. So lots to, co to cover. A few questions. How can people not just spend less, but actually earn money by reducing their electricity use? Are private companies or politics more effective at making an environmental impact? And what exactly is a virtual power plant? So watch this conversation with us now to find out the answer to these and other questions. So Cisco, that's enough for me. Thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, it's great to be with you. Thanks so much for having me. Of course. And where are you joining the, the call from? I am in Oakland, California. Very nice. Uh, I actually grew up in the Bay Area, a little bit further south near San Jose. So, oh, that's great. Um, yeah, it's a very well, nice we part are, of the uh, world. Much of the state is on fire. Speaking of climate change right now, it's been a really hard summer, um, but it is a beautiful day here. And part of the problem is the wind is coming right through Oakland and blowing mm. it. And then that's what's blowing these fires into Lake Tahoe and everything else. Yeah. It's helping us in the moment, but not helping the state. Yeah, it's uh, it's been really challenging. I've heard my family talking about just um, having a hard time going outside again, like like it was last year. Um, well, this kind of actually ties into the topic today, and so three, broadly speaking, the three things I'd, I'd love for us to talk about uh, and cover is number one, how Ohm Connect works, because this is a really interesting uh, idea and method. Um, number two, really the moment of inspiration and how it all came about. And then finally, what we can all do to be more environmentally friendly in our daily lives. So um, how does that sound? That sounds great. I like Excellent. It. Perfect. And if you're watching this conversation live, as always, please feel free to share your comments and questions for Cisco in the chat. And uh, I'll be monitoring and I'll, we'll do our very best to go through them and answer them. So truly enough for me over to you. So Cisco, <laughs> what exactly is Ohm Connect. Yeah, well, you described it really well. Ohm, look, Ohm Connect is a totally free service. People sign up. We'll give them free things like smart plugs or smart thermostats or other things like that that uh, allow you uh, for easy control of energy use in the home. And then we'll pay you uh, for reducing your energy use during some key times when the grid is really stressed. And you really said it perfectly, which is that normally, you know, and this is true everywhere in the world, when there's a peak demand or there's intermittent issues on the on the grid, we turn on uh, a, a peak or power plant, mm -hmm. fossil fuels, in California, a lot of natural gas, um, but they're the dirtiest, most expensive plants to use, and we've got to stop using them. Uh, but we do need to still manage the grid very well. So what we've done is really turn hundreds of thousands of individual homes into one kind of symphony that acts like peaker power plants. And so we can actually reduce the demand by the same amount uh, that a power plant would turn on and produce. And then mm -hmm. we get paid the same and that's how we pay our customers. That's amazing. And so with this movement towards renewable energy, I mean, in mm -hmm. an ideal world, we would never, we would stop using any type of fossil fuel for for electricity and we would only use renewable energy how because i actually never i didn't know about these peaker plants before um but it makes sense you know do we currently have any sort of contingency plans for that time when we're fully renewable and all of a sudden everyone decides to turn on all their lights and air conditioning and the heater at the same time 
Yeah, this is one of those like uh, ugly little secrets that people don't seem to like to talk about with our conversion to, to clean energy. And, and it's not, look, it's not just about converting to clean energy. The, the grid itself is old and failing on its own. Mm. And it's particularly struggling under the weight of, we were just talking about some of these climate induced in, uh, weather extremes. Right. Um, so we're having issues regardless. But the big issue is if you want to get to 100% clean energy, which we do as fast as possible. It's like the most important thing for climate. What we've really got to do then is we've got to learn to switch the grid. Was For 100 years, we have managed the grid by changing supply to meet demand. And now we need to actually manage demand to meet supply. Hmm. So we're turning it around. And that's because solar and wind is incredibly cheap now. It's incredibly clean. It's great. The problem is it doesn't run consistently all the time. In particular, solar, of course, goes off every night, it's intermittent every night. Yeah. So we only have a couple of ways to solve that, uh, one of which is a lot of battery storage, and we're going to need a lot of battery storage. But we can't just create batteries to solve that problem. We also need to be able to shift demand. And we want to be able to do that in a way that doesn't harm people, that people are sort of don't even care about and they can get paid for. But we've got to be able to turn the grid around so that supply and demand are both flexing. Um, and that's something we've never really done before. And I, I think becomes incredibly important as we drive to zero carbon. Mm -hmm. Can you um, can you kind of describe what you mean by shifting demand in a bit more detail? Yeah. So traditionally, we call the, the, the world calls this sort of demand response. And what we're doing today is, as I say, it's not your grandmother's demand response. But demand response is like a... Uh, it's been around for decades. And what it says is, look, if, if, there's an, uh, if there's an emergency, maybe once or twice a year, you can pull this lever and people will stop. Mostly companies and factories will reduce the amount of energy they're using pretty quickly. And they don't like to do that, but they'll do it in a pinch and they'll get paid for it a couple of times, maybe a year. What we actually need to do is have the demand for electricity all across the entire system reduced at fairly large amounts, and we need to do that more or less every day. Hmm. So what does that look like? Well, for our 180 now thousand California customers, what it means is that multiple times a week, you will we will adjust something in your home quietly. Maybe we'll turn off your refrigerator for 15 minutes, or we'll change the setting on your air conditioner for 30 minutes. You probably won't notice we've done it. But by doing that across hundreds of thousands of devices and appliances at once, we're able to actually flex the demand down. And today we're about 150 megawatts, which makes us about three peaker power plants. Uh, so we need to dramatically scale that. But that's really how it works. It's, it's just being able to predictably and reliably reduce energy use a little bit in each home, but do it in such great numbers that we actually achieve large scale reductions. How does it work in the situation where, you know, all of a sudden it ends up being a really hot day and before you know it, everyone's AC is on and there is peak demand way completely unexpectedly. There's no way to predict that. How do you actually manage that situation? So uh, a couple of ways. And, and we actually saw this in, uh, we've seen it already some this year and really uh, we saw it last year in California when we ended up with rolling blackouts. But we mm -hmm. uh, at Home Connect, our customers helped avoid a lot worse situation. So what we do is as it comes through, we have a bunch of tools we can do to dig deeper. We can send text messages, uh, emails, uh, plus control devices, all those things. So we can throw everything at it. But the key here is we pay people. So instead of being like, oh, please use less, we say, it's a, we're, hey, we're heading into a really tough afternoon. Can you please, tonight at 7 o'clock, from 7 to 9 o'clock, I want you to use half your energy. And by the way, I'm going to pay you. And some, in, in just a few days in August, we paid our customers uh, $1.3 million. Wow. And that's just money we were getting paid because we were acting like a power plant. So this is the way that you kind of get this to work is, Mostly people don't notice it's happening quietly, but on when you're talking about those emergency days when so, it's really hot, maybe it's unpredicted or something's gone wrong, like a transmission lines come down. Well, we need to be able to react quickly. And it turns out if you if you teach people how to do it and you align their economic interests, then they're willing to do it and they feel pretty good about it. So <laughs> we asked people to do a lot last August and they did. And instead of quitting the program, they told their friends and neighbors. So our referrals went through the roof. Uh, because they're like, look, don't be a sucker and just do it for free. You should get paid. 
Um, and we had people making, you know, 30, 50, even a hundred plus dollars a day, depending wow. on how much they were saving. So it's a really powerful way to give everybody access to benefits of clean energy and enable a clean energy grid. Um, and uh, also put some money in pockets, which mm -hmm. you know, turns out to be really important too. So when you say that you act like a p power plant, you're actually doing it sort of in the sense rather than, I mean, traditionally a peaker plant creates energy. You That's act right. like a power plant by reducing the amount of energy consumed. So you're right. No, and that you, thanks for saying that because this is like that thing that people always have their heads. <laughs> so we are... We became a couple of years ago the first entity we think ever in the country, but certainly in California, that doesn't generate any power and has no infrastructure. To so we have no plant. Uh, so the power plant we have neither. What instead we do is we reduce the amount of energy used, but we do it predictably and reliably. The grid actually doesn't care whether you reduce demand or increase supply, it just needs to be perfectly aligned at all times, right? Mm -hmm. That is, it's a, it's a marvel how, quite, how much we have to balance that in real time to the second. And so for a long time, physics has known this and federal law has said for a decade, you have to, hey, everybody, you need to pay for energy reductions the same way you pay for energy production. But until we showed up, there haven't really been anyone to do that, particularly in the residential space, but who could really do this at scale and with the predictable, reliable um, features. I mean, last year we dispatched, we were dispatched in the state grid operator a thousand, over a thousand times on 298 days. So almost every day we were active um, with some portion of our users across the state. Wow, that's incredible. And and but and so you were saying that it happens quietly. Most of the time people don't even realize it's happening. So you're just dialing things down. Actually, how, how do you do that so that people don't even realize that it's happening? Well, so look, and, and some people sign up and say, hey, no, let me know. I want a text message. So there's a whole variety of ways people apply this. And we have, as we talked about, you know, in big events, we'll do ohm hours. And ohm hours are, hey, we'll give you notice ahead of time, an hour or two. We want you to both let us control your devices in the home, but also can you use less in general? Mm -hmm. And that's things like don't do your laundry yet. Don't you know, put off your dishwasher, those big appliances that use things that use a lot of, of, of uh, heat or cooling, all that stuff can just put it off. Like you've permission to not do your chores for a couple hours, set it off and we'll pay you to do it. We'll pay you to not do your chores right now. Do them later, do them in the morning. So that's the key thing. Now, from there, we also then control in real time a lot of these devices. And these this has to happen so quickly, we don't have time to text message you and ask you to do something. We're just doing it and paying you for it. And those things, look, it's a lot of it's thermostats where we're changing the setting on your smart thermostat, just a few degrees for a little while. Mm -hmm. What that, again, that just means that you may not even notice, but overall we've reduced demand quickly. Mm -hmm. Other things are these smart plugs. We have tens of thousands, probably now a hundred thousand things we control on these little, easy little smart plugs. And what that is, is like it's often a refrigerator or an air purifier these days or a space heater in the winter, a wall air conditioner. And all we do is we, we can see it's on and we can turn it off for a little while and then we turn it back on and we pay you uh, for, the, for that purpose. So you might notice that it's gone off or you might open the fridge and notice the light's not on. But the fridge is fine. It's going to keep temperature for a long time. Um, and that's kind of what we do. And so, you, yeah, you have a choice. You can put it on things that don't bother you that much or are worth it to you uh, and uh, will help you figure out what's both works for you, but also reduces energy use substantially. Um, a lot of times people think it's lights because that's what we grew up, you know, like turn off the lights when you leave the room, but yeah, uh, it's not really lights anymore. <laughs> well, that's, that's a good new, good sign, I suppose, yeah. of that we're moving forward and, and, yeah, you know, lights LEDs. are exactly. Um, so if you're, if you're on vacation for like a month, uh, mm -hmm. can you in theory just get paid during that time if you turn everything off? So how it works is actually a rolling 10 day average of your home. So you, we have the data off your smart meter, just like the utilities do. And what happens is every single day, we have a new forecast for your expected energy use. And this is, this is how the federal government tells us to do it. Hmm. So it's a 10 day rolling average and it looks at what you've used over the last 10 days. And it says, great, what I care about is that during the, the time we've dispatched you, you've used less. So less than the expected amount. So if you go on vacation for a couple of days, sure, yeah, if you're gone, 
and we happen to have no, an event during while you're gone, it, you're going to make money and no one's home. It's like a win-win. And when you get back, you're like, great, that was just easy. But if you're gone for a couple of weeks, that average catches up with you, mm. right? And then at that point, you're still with the electronic devices, we're still able to get some savings because you're not here and you can turn off your fridge for a little while and things like that. So it, you'll still make some, but it, it, generally speaking, it's designed to make sure the system is designed to make sure it's a real reduction from what would have happened, not just some anomalous thing that happened because you um, never use energy or anything. Understood. And what what's the benefit benefit or why is the grid motivated to pay you and then the users, uh, it, it, you know, for that savings? Is it, is it, I mean, where, where is the benefit to them really? So we, you kind of mentioned it right at the beginning, I'll go back to it, which is while we are not a power plant, we're a power plant. We reduce energy rather than produce it, but we get paid the same. So if you are the utility and you need to buy power from the state grid operator, um, and the state grid operator has says, oh, says, you know, and this happens like literally every minute, every second, 15 minutes, day ahead, all these different things. They say, okay, we're going to need more megawatts in 15 minutes in the Fresno area. They say, and we need 20 megawatts. Who's got what? And then we automatically bid in 10,000 times a day. We bid in and we say exactly how many megawatts we have and exactly where. And we're bidding right there against or with alongside the peaker power plants we talked about. So when we get dispatched, it is because a we are being dispatched almost always instead of one of those peaker plants, either turning on or turning up. So we get paid the same as that power plant and we just turn around and pay our customers the big chunk of that hmm. as well. So that's how we get paid is we're not, there's no subsidy. We're just getting paid the market price of electricity when it's needed as it's needed. That's so cool. And it just makes sense. So in that, in that sense, it really does come back to why you call yourself a virtual power plant because you right. really are. Um, but and it I, does take 17 minutes to get, it, it, it's complicated, right? People's yeah. heads kind of, and they think we're a scam, right? Our biggest problem is we're a free service that gives away free things and pays you. And people are like, yeah, that's not a thing. That Too good to happens. be true. So yeah, so we struggle a lot with how to get people over that that concern that this isn't real because nobody really understands the physics and or machinery of the energy and electricity markets. And, mm -hmm. and we, we don't want to have to make them understand that. We just want them to, to engage productively. Yeah. I mean, it, it is in, in some ways quite a disruptive technology because you're actually, you're working on the demand side rather than the supply side, which is traditionally, I, th I mean, that's what you said at the very beginning, we need to change demand to meet supply um, rather than the other way around. And that's traditionally, mm -hmm. I think, the opposite approach of how yeah. things are normally done is oh, more people want stuff, great, let's make more of it. And But here it's actually, well, we have a limited amount of stuff, so let's make sure that we kind of dial it down to meet that. Exactly, um, exactly. Well said. To me, it sounds like this is a really important way, speaking of renewable energy, to, to get us to renewable energy faster. Because, you know, if we have these peak peaks going, then even with renewable energy, being able to quickly turn on something, uh, renewable energy, at least at this point, even with massive battery storage, I don't think has the ability to just quickly meet demand for everyone in Los Angeles turning on their AC all of a sudden. No, and, and and Daniel, the hardest part is, you know, think about it, it's like eight o'clock at night. It used to be that the peak power times would come in the middle of the day. Mm. But now, actually now, because of all the solar and renewable energy and everything else, it happens at night. So the worst time for the grid is often like eight o'clock. It's when the sun's gone down, but it's still hot in the summer or still cold in the winter. We don't have the solar online anymore. Most of that demand at like eight o'clock in California, the majority of it's actually residential demand. It's people coming home and doing what they do, right? Turning on stuff and hitting their air conditioner and starting their dishwashers. Hmm. And what's really changed over the last 10 years is it's not just about like, oh, we talk about efficiency, which is important. You want to use less in general. You want to be efficient. But you know what? It, it's, you know, it's coming up on, on noon in California, right? right? Right now, like there's plenty of solar here. Like use, use power now. Like turn stuff on. Like we often, including yesterday, had negative pricing in certain parts, meaning that we'll pay you, the state will pay you to use more energy right now. <laughs> like we want you to be inefficient. 
<laughs> like just turn stuff on. Um, that's happening in the middle of the day because there's so much solar and not as much, you know, and not as much net demand. Hmm. Now at eight o'clock at night, it's very different. So we don't want people to necessarily all the time use less or be, we just want you to change when it's happening. That's why we're like, Hey, do your dishes later. That'd be great. Um, and I think as people start to understand that, that is one of the most important changes that we need people to kind of get as we go forward into zero carbon. Um, you know, it, you don't need to, you know, live miserably. You just need to, we need to shift when you do things. There's a button on uh, most dishwashers. It's like delay, delay start. And I, I, everyone asks, people like, I have no idea why there's that button. Why would you ever want to delay the start on your dishwasher? That is the craziest thing. And for most people, they have no idea. This is why, right? It's like, you know what? Load it up, hit delay start tonight, you know, after everyone's gone to bed and there's power on the grid again, it'll run. So that's kind of, the, the, those are the things that people need to start to do. And what we do at Ohm Connect is we pay you to figure that out. Hmm. We pay you to make those changes and uh, it works that's it's also it's really coming together now and i think what would make it even more powerful is with the advent of iot because yeah. if all of your devices are also aware of when this energy when the best time to turn the energy on or mm -hmm. you know so i have laundry machine i have my dishwasher whatever else and if there's a way for them to know well actually now no one else is really doing stuff so i'll, I'll start running now that's I mean, right. that, that would be brilliant if there's a way to And that's to do the that. direction that we, we are going, probably not fast enough. And that's what Ohm Connect is designed to do, right? And then because most things don't come with that control yet mm -hmm. or a control that can be used by us usefully or, or anybody else, we have to sort of fake it until you can make it. So that's why we give people smart plugs, right? Because we can turn anything you plug in into a smart device with a $5 plug that we'll give mm. you. So we're really trying to jumpstart this process and not just wait for all that to show up in the dishwasher, but really start to figure out how we can give people the tools to do this now, because we don't have time. We don't have time to sit around and be like, oh, that's great. I'm going to get a new dishwasher in 10 years. I hope it has that feature. Yeah. We're going to need to go sooner than that. That's a really, really good point. And I, I mean, speaking of kind of changing subjects, but speaking of the fires, you know, how do you see this technology being an important aspect of a change in climate because i think you know that's just the fact of life is the climate is changing we need to adjust to it hopefully not too much and hopefully we there's a way to mitigate or even reverse but in a world where things are changing and it does get hot in random times when it's not really supposed to or cold how can um connect really be a solution in those situations yeah and we're i mean look we're seeing these weather extremes like they're not even extreme anymore. They're just all the time. Mm. You know, Texas had blackouts that lasted for days because of a, 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 a really surprising cold snap. Uh, California had blackouts. Tex uh, in New York, several times this year, they've sent emergency text messages out to people's cell phones that said, please use less energy. We're about to have blackouts. Wow. And people responded. But what we've learned in California is that you can't call an emergency all the time. So now when the state, which has already done five or six sort of emergency response calls this summer, and we're not even into like the worst of it yet, um, people have stopped responding to those voluntary requests because they're just coming too often and you start ignoring them. So that makes what we do even more important. There's several ways. So like right now, uh, because of climate change, we have, you know, the amount of hydropower in California is down about 7%, which is way, way off from where it was last year and way off from normal. It's often, it can be in the 20% uh, percent of our power. Wow. It's also flexing power, right? We can, we can speed it up and slow it down. We're losing that. We have you know, them coming, they're coming offline. Um, the, the big fire, the bootleg fire in Oregon, came through and uh, they had to depower one of the main transmission lines that takes power from the, the Northwest, Pacific Northwest down into California. That was a five gigawatt loss, almost in, without almost any notice uh, on a Friday afternoon. So these kinds of things are driven by these weather extremes all across the country and they are wreaking havoc on our grid. How we, we, you know, we can't solve all of it just by flexing our demand here and there. But when the bootleg fire came through and that happened, we dispatched 
in an emergency, we dispatched uh, a lot of our users and we quickly reduced the amount of energy that was needed so that we could help sustain the grid through that really difficult afternoon, giving the state time to put other things in action that help support it. And that's because we have 170,000 appliances and devices that we can reach on and touch near instantly, so within minutes. And that that was a place where, well, yeah, well, you know, it wasn't planned. It was driven by this fire. It hit a transmission line. And all of a sudden, we were able to step in and do it. And that is the way we're going to get through this because we're not going back to normal anytime soon, maybe mm -hmm. ever. No. Well, I mean, I think the... It, it's incredible to hear how it works and that it it's it it's so um it can be really quick response and i mean i can really visualize as this as um connect I, I imagine this is what you're aiming for becomes nationwide mm -hmm. the ability for states to really help each other and you know you, you can say well california is struggling so let's turn off oregon let's turn off nevada um you know, turn off every other light bulb in Las Vegas. That'll probably do a lot for half the country. Yeah. Um, <laughs> That'll probably be the last place, but yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, and we did that in, in February. The, the, the challenge that hit essentially the natural gas infrastructure that took Texas offline, um, you know, that rippled throughout the Midwest and the, and the West, and all those systems are connected. So we ended up getting very high power costs in California. And any natural gas we don't burn here then for fuel becomes available somewhere else mm. to deal with the fact that they're having enormous shortages. So we actually dispatched widely in February, which was one of the first times we've ever been in California dispatch, but it was because we were essentially responding uh, to the, the real problem in the other part of the Midwest and the South. Um, and I think that's, you know, people, the, the Texas electricity grid is islanded for the most part, not right. totally, but, but the natural gas links are not, Right, those who are coming from all over the country, so we are able to support each other, even across pretty big distances. Yeah, it's amazing, and then I think that, and I, I didn't mention this at the beginning, but I think this capability that you have and the the mass impl uh, implications of being able to do this is is probably the reason why um, you you got um, Connect got a um, one hundred million dollar uh, fundraise back in December. So congratulations on that. I think that's incredible to see that um, you know the fact that there's you're, you're just getting so much backing and the the vision is there and clearly um i mean you're you're backed by alphabet which is amazing yeah and, and it, you know you can imagine the conversation i went out last summer i was like all right i know this is going to sound weird but i would like you to give me financing to build a power plant in california it's going to be 500 megawatts but here's the catch i don't create any power there's no infrastructure <laughs> there's no plant um but it's economic like we can create megawatts of reduction that um are are, are economic and, and i really excited that uh, our friends at sidewalk infrastructure partners which is a spinoff of alphabet were able to sort of get through i think and understand it and, and and to have started from a place of like this is where the grid has to go how do we help it and and was able to work with us to do what is a first of its kind mm -hmm. uh, it won't be the last i hope <laughs> uh but it is um it was a big leap forward uh in, in i think for infrastructure finance to fund this next generation of distributed infrastructure if if everyone in the us ended up using ohm connect mm -hmm. how much power virtually would ohm connect be able to produce um Right. And we've actually looked at this, uh, in, not maybe everybody, but we said, all right, what happens? And, you know, if once you get to, um, you know, 10 million across the country and not all parts of the country can do what we can do in California or Texas or New York, they don't mm -hmm. have um, wholesale electricity markets. So you'd have to do it in some places in partnership with the incumbent utility provider. Um, because while we sell to utilities, it's, you know, it's on a open market. And not everywhere in the country, although most of the country is covered by one, not everyone is. But if you just look at that, you can get, you know, just think there are 10 million, I think, Nest thermostats in the country, roughly speaking. That's just the Google smart thermostat. Um, and that's a rough number and maybe it's wrong. But just if you get all 10 million, right, to do this, we're talking about creating what would be by double the largest power plant in North America. We would more than double the capacity 
of uh, the the uh, the dam outside of Las Vegas um, or any of the other facilities. So we're talking about 10, 15 gigawatts. And that's just looking at like, hey, what happens if you get into that level of penetration? And the device that we need, a core device that we need is already there. Hmm. So now we're talking about hundreds of millions of dollars of payments to families all throughout the country for essentially just access to changing a few degrees on their thermostat, which they probably won't even notice. And if they do, they can always override it or they can be like, oh, I'm a little warm. Guess I'm getting paid. You know, it's a it's a very different, it's it's a hard mindset shift. But the good news is, I hope we're actually not that far from getting there. I think we can get there in the next few years. That's one wow. of the things that's so exciting about working with Google or we work with Ecobee and Emerson, all these other folks that we're working with um, is that we, we have that access. I mean, 10 million in the U.S. is 3% roughly of the country. I mean, we're not even talking massive percentages here. It's just like a little portion and yeah. the impact is huge. It is. And, and you know, obviously um, we're talking about... Um, you know, a change in people's mindset as to what's happening and their connection to their community. And there's legitimate fear over this. Um, you know, one of the things we've done with Home Connect is we sort of built it from the customer up. And we said, we started with like, I know it would be better for us and for the grid if I could take control of your thermostat and you couldn't change that. I could just do it. You, you I would be much more, I, it would be easier for me to predict and I'd get more because, but you know what? When my grandma, when my mother, <laughs> is over for her birthday and we have an ohm event i'm just not that's not a good time for me to do this right it doesn't matter what the grid situation is i'm out and i need to be able to say no and so we've always said customers are always in charge you can decide which devices are under which control and for when you can always override them including during the event and we've done this enough and we have enough data that we actually can predict what's going to happen we know how many people are going to opt out. We know how many people are not going to be able to respond to that event. And so even though I don't have the mandatory control, we figured out another way to do that that actually respects our customers and the fact that they have, you know, they have circumstances that sometimes aren't it, where it's not okay and they don't want to participate or they just can't. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, it makes sense. And, and I think that flexibility is, is really important. Yeah. Um, and that, that just makes it a much more enjoyable experience. Um, I mean, what was the, what was the inspiration behind this? How did this whole, was there like a moment when the idea kind of formulated and, and it, it all came together? Well, so I, I've been with the company for a few years, but if credit to the founders who are still there and an incredible group, um, three in particular, but I just want to note, um, two of them really came with, uh, you know, we're just really lucky if we pull this off, we are very lucky they found each other and stuck with it because it's hard. Mm. So one, Matt Dusterberg, he was an energy trader and a data guru. And so he was one of the first people trading energy like you would trade stocks hmm. uh, for our company. He had portfolios and they were trading. And he was like, you know what? There's got to be a better way, right? I'm making money on this. I can tell what's happening. I can sell high and I can sell uh, yeah, uh, high and buy low and do all the things I need to do. But I bet we could solve the problem and pay people. And then he joined uh, in part with Kadir, who was the chief tech, had been the chief technology officer at Zynga. It went from zero to a hundred millions of millions of people playing Farmville and words with friends all over the world. Kind of pioneered social gaming as a thing that's not you know done in your basement as a teenager, but just like we all do it. Mm -hmm. um, they got together, and so between them, figured out like how do you engage customers and do this at scale in a way that works. And how do you bundle all that into something that actually works, it, it, that works in the grid? And thank God they came together because that, that took years of just like heavy labor to figure out how to do that. And so I get to come along if, you know, and show up right when they're like, I think we figured this out, but nobody believes us. And I'm like, ah, I can help. <laughs> I will help. And so, you know, my, my skill in this, you know, I, I was looking I'd left my last company and I was like the most, if we don't flex demand, particularly residential electricity demand, we're going to blow up the grid before we get to zero carbon and nobody's figuring this out. Like, I don't, like, I couldn't figure out like, why isn't this a crisis that people are talking about? I get that it's not as exciting as a battery, but come on, we got to get this figured out. And I was searching the world and thankfully 
found Ohm Connect. And I was like, I think you guys, I couldn't believe they'd done what they had done. And it, it turns out that um, I could be helpful uh, to them at that moment. And so they, they recruited me to join. But uh, it is, um, I'm thankful now in 2021 that I think finally the world is sort of looking at what we do and realizing that it's important. Hmm. Um, and, I, and I think that's a big change. And I think it's because of Texas and the blackouts in New York and everything else that finally has got people's attention on the fragility of our grid and, and the need to flex demand to, to manage it. Yeah, I, I, it is, it, it's happening. I, I think it's, it's, unfortunately you need sometimes wake up calls that are not always the most pleasant yeah. um, to really help people understand and see what changes need to be made. Would you say based on your experience that um, being in the private sector uh, with your, your background in finance and now at OmConnect, I mean, is that, would you say it's more effective to make change than politics? Um, it's a great and really hard question because ultimately you need both. What, right. what, I, what I've done, and this is whether I was trying to figure out how to get affordable housing built uh, or working on new financing tools for people to get solar on the roofs, is it's that combo. Look, I think people want to make it, oh, we, we need, you know, there is this sort of segment that says, oh, we just need the private sector to figure it out. And there's a segment that's like, oh, you can't trust those jokers. You need, government needs to mandate and make these things happen. And I, honestly, I just kind of sit right there between the two. I'm like, they're both right. Hmm. Like, you've got to have both. And if, you, if you've got to create rules and markets and systems and protections and all kinds of other things that make it possible and... You know, I mean, we exist, this Ohm Connect, a private company doing this incredibly important work exists in large part because John Wellinghoff and the people at FERC, an organization that most people have never heard of, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, a decade ago, were like, you know what, people should really be required to buy reduced megawatts at the same rate they, or die, they buy produced megawatts. And everyone thought they were nuts. And in fact, they took them to the Supreme Court and challenged it people who thought they were nuts and they won in the Supreme court five years ago. So mm -hmm. that governmental thought forethought before I was thinking of any of this stuff, that was incredible policymaking and politics and they got it done and they fought through the legal courts and that, and that made what we do possible, but you need a company like us to do it. We need to be inventive right. and engage. You need the skills of Kadir and, and Farmville and energy traders you need to figure that out. And then you need to build a market around that. And I think we struggle to understand that those two things go together. It's imperfect. It's messy. I can go on for a long time about the, the challenges we face in California and elsewhere with sort of the inability to get stable rules we can work with and how much they just change and all the things. Everything's just constantly in motion. It's very hard to get investment made because of that. Um, but we need both of those. There's no alternative to it. Uh, and so I'm a believer in both and I've been on both sides. I have been at the federal government and energy. I've been at local government on energy stuff. And I've been in the private sector in various positions, including CEOs as the CEO. Um, and there's just no, we, we have to have both. We have to have smart, thoughtful, engaged politics and policy. And we need the scale and scope of change that only private sector business can make. Yeah, it's tricky. I, th I think, um, I, I hear sort of, it depends on who you speak to, but I hear sort of both sides. Um, some people say, oh, this is, you know, you can't rely on politics. Politics takes too long. It'll never happen if we just wait for politicians and the government to do it. And then you have the other side who say, well, individuals actually can't really make a difference on their own. The only way that we can actually move forward with anything is by enacting legislature and and you know moving legislation and, and moving forward with um government policies and that's the only way but i i'm i'm kind of in the camp of it's all of them individuals make a difference uh, organizations companies business and government all of all of them have a role to play and well, and it's almost it's both better and worse you're absolutely right and that's it, it's it's frustrating because if people want it to be like just go do this thing and right. that'll work like we just need to set really strong government mandates and then this will happen or we don't need the mandates we need the economics you know we, we just have to have it both and, and it's hard too because most you know we can say that politics is broken and in and there's a lot of evidence that it's not working super well right now 
um, and hasn't for a while, particularly on these long term things that we have to deal with or trusting science or anything. But we have to do it with what we have now. We don't have time. Like right now, we have to be reducing carbon. Like the IPCC reports and everything else are just in the, the weather. You're seeing it. So, you know, people are like, oh, we need to break down the system and build a new one. I'm like, I don't have time. Like, when do you think that's going to happen? Um, we can fight that fight and uh, people can do it. But if you care about climate, we have a toolbox now. It is the only toolbox. I'm sorry. But if you could invent cold fusion in your bathtub and we will be cooked before you figure out how to scale that. We have to do a lot now. And that means we need the markets as messy as they are to work. And we need government and politics as messed up as that is to give us something. And we can all freak out about that and say, oh, it's never going to work. Or you can just get the toolbox open and figure it out. And that's that's my approach. Yeah. Just, all right. These are This is what I got. Let's solve the problem. I think it's a good, I think it's the right approach because it's what we have now. And as you start working with what you have now, that's when you start finding newer, better ways and you iterate, improve, and then the tools become better and the toolbox becomes and more improve advanced. what's possible. I mean, we, yeah. you know, exactly. In August of last year, a lot of people didn't believe that our users would show up in an emergency and then they did and we paid them well for it. And that made it possible for some changes to get made over the, so we, it's iterative. But it doesn't, but it's, we don't have time to screw around with a lot of deep thought. I think you just got to put boots on the ground now. Yeah. Uh, I think it's a, it's a really good point. And um, I mean, what kind of innovations are you looking at now? Um, if you can say, or are there any innovations that you'd like to see in the energy sector? Um, so, you know, again, my, a lot of what we try and focus on is what we can do right now. You know, the power of a plug, the power of a thermostat, the power of somebody figuring out that their dishwasher button is meaningful and can make money for them. Those are great. And so, yeah, that's day in and day out. But I think as we look just a little bit further ahead, just think about what's happening with the EV revolution. So electric vehicles, we're now about 10% of new car sales in California are EVs. And that is just going to keep going. So we've got this enormous opportunity. Um, we need to give that make it accessible to people in their homes. And we're going to, if we don't actually start with being able to flex that load, we're going to blow up a bunch of transformers and substations and everything else. Not maybe not literally, but certainly we're going to cause enormous amount of problems. Uh, the system, the grid can't handle it right now. So I, I view the ability for EVs to be part of this solution in terms of the ability to flex and move demand around during charging is going to be really important. And I think that's really powerful. I also think we need to figure out how storage becomes integrated into a lot more things in people's homes. Not maybe the big storage systems people are getting now, the power walls. Those are great, but they're expensive and they're grid tied. There's a whole bunch of pieces to it. How do we make this something basic available to everybody? And there's some companies, you know, they're working on that, that we're talking to because there's also a lot of money they can make those people, if they, if they use those batteries for both emergency response and their own resiliency, but also grid services. So we're trying to figure out with EVs and the democratization and growth of storage in different types and sizes, how we can greatly expand that. So from a home perspective, I really see over the next few years, us doing some really exciting stuff with both ourselves and with partners on that. Um, but I think the majority of what's going to happen in the next couple of years is going to be a smart plug and a thermostat and a text message. And we'll just keep getting better at that too. Yeah. I mean, it sounds like at least from, from those things, those are kind of the baseline that you need to start with. And then as we were saying, you, you grow and build from there. But I think the, um, the point on the EVs is so interesting. It somehow never occurred to me that, you know, it's fantastic that we're moving towards electric vehicles, but if everyone's charging their car at the exact same time, that's going to cause a peaker plant to go off. So like it sort of defeats the purpose of, um, of the whole thing. So, um, that's right. And, that's and just the, 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 the distribution system isn't designed to take that level of demand hitting all at once people getting home, and literally quadrupling the amount of energy their home normally uses like instantly and kind of all at once. It's like in the Super Bowl, everyone flushes their toilet at the same time. <laughs> and so the people who do water systems have to like worry about that. They're like, okay, let's get ready. It's almost <laughs> half time. <laughs> I'm going to flush and you have to get ready. Well, the EVs are like that, except every day and, you know, and for electricity. And so we're going to have to figure that out.
And, and I think Ohm Connect's going to help. We're, we already control about 2,000 electric vehicle chargers. Uh, we've learned a lot. Um, it's still nascent, but we'll, we'll get there. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, because doesn't it take like um, cup, just a few hours to charge a car fully? Yeah, I mean, it depends on the type of charge and everything else. But, you know, if, if you've got a 200-mile range you, you and you're down low on battery, you, you need most of the night. Um, oh, really? Okay. To charge now six, eight hours, that kind of thing. I mean, I have oh, wow. one, and it just kind of depends. But the nice thing about that, though, is you know you can you don't really care until seven a.m. Right? What's happened? So you exactly. can kind of modulate that over the course of uh, the evening very effectively without any impact mm -hmm. on the customer. I think hot water heaters, as we electrify hot water heating, becomes another really valuable tool in our tool belt. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, that's the one thing I've learned about kind of sustainability, broadly speaking, as an overall field is typically once you start reducing something on one side, it impacts something else on another side. And, you know, yeah, exactly. It's nice that we're moving towards electric water heaters, so we're not using gas anymore. But yeah, you have all these other challenges that, you know, you kind of don't even think about because it's right. not in your backyard anymore, um, which is I mean, it's an opportunity. I see it as an opportunity to, to help. It is. It's both. I mean, I think it's a great opportunity and it'll actually hot water heaters, electric hot water heaters are an incredible ability for us. Cause if you hot water is hot, you don't care whether I've turned off the heating for 15 minutes or an hour. Right. No. <laughs> and it's it'll true. stay hot in there. It's fine. Um, so that's a great like thermal battery, right? It, you just kind of regulate that. And we do that today. We, we control a bunch of, of, hmm. uh, electric hot water heaters. And we see that very important in the future. Those are actually, from a grid perspective, an electric hot water heater is almost as valuable as battery storage. Hmm. It's, you know, again, you find all these ridiculously interesting little tidbits in there yeah. uh, once you start actually doing the work. And some of that's scary and some of it's like, oh, that's good news. That's something we can work with. Yeah, that's very cool. Um, are there any sustainability leaders that you admire or perhaps uh, books, podcasts, TV shows or movies or anything that you can recommend anyone who's interested in, in learning more about, you know, how we can actually make electricity sustainable and use it as a tool to get us to net zero. So there are, uh, so first uh, CNBC, believe it or not, did like a 20, 25 minute explainer on the grid and this whole issue. And, and, and what we do, flexible demand, shows up in parts of it about halfway through. Okay. It shows up. It's on our website, um, the Ohm Connect website. I love it. It's like the, it was one of the best descriptions I've ever seen. And it, it, you know, twenty minutes is still twenty minutes, but it's twenty minutes. If you want to understand kind of how the grid works and what we're trying to solve for here, um, honestly, it's great, and it's up on our website. And kudos to CNBC for putting it together. And um, then, if you want to look at like leaders, there's a couple of folks I'm really excited about that I just think of real heroes to me. One is a guy named Danny Kennedy. And Danny um, was one of the founders of a solar company called Sungevity. He is now the leader of a, an entity, a sort of a, a nonprofit organization called New Energy Nexus. And they do a lot of work in California, the US, but a lot of what they're doing actually is trying to create and sustain incubators for clean tech, clean energy and climate related companies all around the world. So like, you know, they're in Malaysia and other places. And you think like for all, anything we're going to do in California, it doesn't matter that much if we can't figure out how Malaysia and Indonesia and Nigeria and other places come along as well. And they don't have that kind of entrepreneurial focus in this space uh, or access to the capital or ideas or any of it. Um, and there's a lot of great people trying to figure it out there. So he, their organization, I'm really excited and a big supporter of their efforts to try and broaden that. Uh, because, you know, I'm, we're in Australia, we're in the U.S., but we really have to solve some problems and, and we, we, have to, we have to tackle this in a bunch of places. Um, and we need lots of local entrepreneurs to figure that out and local policymakers to figure it out. Mm -hmm. uh, so Danny's a great hero. I think, um, you know, always point over there. There's lots of other good folks, you know, besides here. I, you know, I love, um, there's a couple of really great podcasts out there. One is um, Jason Jacobs has one called My Climate Journey. And it's just a great conversation with people about kind of their process of getting, figuring out climate, like it kind of mirrors his experience. He founded a company that was not in the space and got really focused on this and has done it. And he's just got some really great conversations with people like Matt Rogers, who was a co-founder at Nest and Dan Kamen from UC Berkeley. Now, just, he's got a hundred of them. It's great. 
Uh, and then if you really want to dork out, I love John Farrell's local energy rules. And this is one where like you, you gotta, you gotta be like me. You gotta want to dig in. Um, but John does a great job, um, really curating a lot of discussion about small things people are doing in communities that actually have the potential to be transformative. Hmm. That's a, yeah, it's a great list. Some of those sound fascinating. Yeah. And I think, um, yeah, it's, it's always helpful to know the different resources that are available and there's so many of them now as well. So many podcasts, blogs. Oh, it's great. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I go, it's, I, I go running every couple of days and it's like, which one do I get? You know? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. We're spoiled for choice. And so, um, in addition to, of course, installing Ohm Connect and, uh, you know, and, um, taking advantage of, reducing your energy use, what, what are some other things that people can do um, to be more sustainable in their daily lives? Um, I, look, I, the, there's, I mean, there's so many things people can do and I'm, you know, I've solar on my roof and I encourage it, but the reality is I think people get stuck too much right now on, oh, it's the big stuff. I need to buy an electric car to be, you know, and you just, you know, they want to be able to show, show it or get solar or whatever. I would say there's so much we're doing now. I mean, a lot of what people don't understand, and there are a lot of websites and apps and stuff that can track this for you, is the carbon from your electricity varies over the course of a day in almost every part of the country. Hmm. It goes from, you know, very, you know, we, there are brief times in California where we're almost entirely zero carbon. And then there are times where we are, the vast majority is carbon intensive power. That is true in Texas. It is true in New York. It is true everywhere. The, the, you know, the, the actual shift might be different. And there's lots of places where you can track that. So if you're just kind of interested in this stuff and you want to do the right, it's like, understand when the carbon, when the power is carbon intensive and when it isn't hmm. and be thoughtful about it. And you don't have to like be, you know, I'm not saying like you have to turn everything off anytime there's no, there's carbon in the, in the system, but I just love the ability for people to just be a thoughtful about when that is. And it turns out that for often the cost of the power, the price of the power, at least at the wholesale level, tends to, in places like California, mirror the carbon intensity because zero carbon is the cheapest power. So if we can focus on when the power is cheapest and greenest and just be thoughtful about the fact that now it is not just about efficiency, it is about when you're using it. Don't be, you have to be, again, you don't, you don't have to be religious about it. You just need to be thoughtful. It'll also help you save energy on your bill. And it, it'll kind of open your eyes to a lot of other things that are possible. And that decarbonizing electricity and moving things that use fossil fuels to electricity is the number one thing we got to do over the next 10 years. Mm. Uh, and this is just a little trick I think people can use to sort of have some uh, visibility into it. Yeah, it's very cool. Are, are you planning to go outside the U.S.? Yeah, well, we launched last year in Australia nationwide. We have uh, with partnered with Origin Energy. It's gone great. Uh, it's been really fun. Um, awesome. That's the largest energy uh, sub, uh, retailer and uh, in the, in uh, a, the competitive market of Australia. Um, tens of thousands of folks have signed up and are participating. We've had over a thousand events already, um, so that's exciting. And yeah, we want to look. We've had some. We've done a bunch of. We did uh, participate in some stuff in Japan recently. We've had a lot of inbound from Europe. Everyone's struggling with how to deal with this grid transition, and so I would like to figure out. Um, next year how to get into at least one one more international market no yeah, it'd be awesome i mean i can i can only imagine that people are are really would would love to take advantage of this and and use it because it sounds like it's so simple and you you realize that you really are making a big difference and if you get paid as well it's yeah fantastic well, and look you like we talked about earlier like you by yourself doing it that's that's great and you're not going to get paid for it by yourself but if you part of a community like Ohm Connect and we do it together, mm -hmm. that's where the value comes. So this is one of those places where like, yeah, it's just you doing something, but if we all just do something together, actually that is so much more valuable than you doing it by yourself. It has exactly. so many more follow on impacts. You're not just using a little less carbon yourself that time, you are enabling the transition to zero carbon in its entirety. It's just mm -hmm. really powerful how we can do things together. Um, and what we have to do at the back end is complicated, but what you have to do isn't. It just, it just, let's just make it simple. Yeah, it's, it's wonderful. And so for, for anyone who wants to learn more about Home Connect, get involved, test it out, where's the best place to go for that? OhmConnect.com, uh, O-H-M Connect.com. And um, 
you can uh, you can check it out if uh, you're not in a, our area yet. You know, we'll try and get there soon. We have about 1.2 million people around the world that have signed up and said, "Hey, we want to participate in this," and a lot of them, uh, hundreds of thousands, are in areas we don't yet serve. And awesome. so that helps us understand where to go. And it's one of the reasons we're in Texas now. We just launched in Texas. Cool. Uh, we're not publicly available there. We will be soon. We have just friends and family in it right now as we test and work it out. But part of that was because, believe it or not, not only are energy prices high in Texas, things are crazy, but people just started signing up in Texas for no, for, for we can tell for no good reason. <laughs> we're like, okay, there's an interest here. So uh, it's a good signal to us. That's brilliant. Well, Cisco, thank you so much for your time and going through this. It's fascinating to hear about the work that, that you and the team at Own Connect are doing. And it sounds like you're making a huge impact and, and you're really just getting started. So um, I hope so. We, we need to get a lot further along. Uh, so thank you for having me. It's been fun. Yeah. You haven't gotten this far just to get this far. No. Hope not. Yeah. So um, we have uh, Cisco DeVries from Own Connect joining us today. Thank you again to talk about the benefits of creating a virtual power plant that reduces our dependence on fossil fuels. So Cisco, thank you again very much. And thank you everyone for joining us today. Thank Take you. care.